and yeah, now I did it. Uh, uh, the second point is that everyone is welcome to talk. It's not like a seminar or webinar or monotalk or monologue or dialogue. It's uh, a, a brainstorming event. So everyone is invited to talk. And please, um, if you want to talk, raise a hand and uh, we will invite you to talk. And also, we are a lot of people here today. And let's try to be time conscious when we talk. So, uh, um, uh, oh, Stephanie, you want to talk? Or, uh, uh, it's reactions. It's click. Ah, yeah, we can use. You can even add reactions in between if you like. Yes, you we can add. It. Yeah, nice. Um, and um, yeah, let's try to be time conscious, but not like me now talking and talking and talking, but maybe uh, taking one, two minutes. So we give everyone a chance to talk. And um, next, uh, this event is for, is for you, for everyone who is a uh, learning and development expert or is new to learning and development field or just interested in learning and development and is building online courses. And what do we want to get out of it? So, of course, we are going to explore the topic about engagement. And it's important to see that, yeah, we want to brainstorm and we wanted to have some solutions, but we also understand that we are not going to have like a very well-defined solutions in just one hour, but uh, we want to get fresh ideas. We want to get inspired. We want to brainstorm. We want to have this a little networking event. And of course we want to have fun. So let's, let's have fun together in this happy space. And, um, yeah, we, we will have some polls today. I want to check if it works. Let me uh, start uh, this thing. Uh, can you can you see it? Can you vote? Oh, yeah. So let's uh, vote. Uh, nice. And in the mean, meantime, I will continue. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, I would like uh, also to ask you, who are you? Maybe you can share in the chat window, where are you from? Who are you? What's your name? If you want that people connect with you, you can also share your LinkedIn profile. Just uh, tell a, bit, a little bit about yourself, uh, about your interests and um, what brings you here. And while you, you're writing in the chat, I hope you are, uh, I will introduce myself. For those who don't know me yet, I am Olga. I am originally from Ukraine. This is why I have this weird accent. Uh, I lived a long time in Portugal, and now I live in Berlin for seven years. Uh, my background is in software engineer. I is in software engineering. I've been developing software for twelve years, and I've been also deeply engaged in e-learning. I co-founded an educational studio in Ukraine where we built e-learning courses from scratch. Uh, I wrote three books on software development, and uh, one of them was actually about how we created a platform for, um, for uh, creating courses. And uh, yeah, uh, and actually this uh, platform gave origin to our company, which is called Workademy. At Workademy, we build this learning management system for growing companies. And please follow us if you want to get uh, updates on some educational technology news or some interesting facts or reports in learning and development world. And of course, updates on these events because we are running them, them regularly and the topics are super exciting and we have also exciting speak speakers. Speaking of topics, today we are going to explore the topic of engagement in corporate learning. We are going to try to understand why it is important or maybe not to have the employees engaged in learning while we provide them with trainings and learning and development and how to do it, what techniques can we use, what tools can we use. And for this, now I'm getting uh, to our amazing uh, guest speaker today who is with me. It's Stephanie. Stephanie will introduce the topic. Stephanie is a lead service and learning designer. She's a researcher in learning design. She, uh, she also a published author and she is a winner of international e-learning awards. And I will pass the word to Stephanie before we start brainstorming to Stephanie for Stephanie to introduce this topic. <laughs> 
and to get us all on the page uh, about engagement. So welcome, Stephanie, and thank you so much for being here. The mm -hmm. mic is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much, Olga, for, for yeah, introducing me and uh, thanks for all the participants for joining our session. Yes, as Olga already mentioned, um, I'm working as a lead service designer. I've been working with big corporates since years. And I also um, researched the topic uh, learning design quite well. I'm a business economics um, and all the, the projects I work in are, are all based on how can we really engage the customers <laughs> to um, yeah to, to like our new products or services how when, can we engage learners to really love and use the learning product we create and this is really something which yeah is more or less my, my passion to really um, not just give people something and let them <laughs> alone uh, with what we created, but really create an um, experience, you know, experience based learning. And uh, here you can see not a picture of me, it's my avatar. And it's already, I think, eight or 10 years ago. So I already started with immersive learning forms and 3D learning. Um, and this is my, yeah, my avatar in one of my teaching classes a few years ago. And I published uh, um, some things at the Columbia University in New York and was um, honored by this with um, the International E-Learning Award. And one of the topics was how can we engage more through impro theater methods in virtual 3D rooms with avatars. So super fancy stuff, but back to reality, back to corporates where we don't experiment that much. Our goal in corporate learning design is to create a value for the corporate, for the employee, for the learners. And how can we do this? How can we engage the learners to reach our common goal? This book, Design Agility, is not mainly a learning design book. It's something what I co-authored with Oka Schlüter. Um, this is more about how you can create um, a product or service out of yeah, content. And because learning content is also content, this the steps I use from my methodological approach, which I will share with you here, is based on the designability approach. Um, uh, nice, Stephanie. I have a question. I will ask several questions maybe before we uh, <laughs> before we start brainstorming. Why is it important at all to engage? Uh, employees in, in learning? I mean, they have to work, they are paid for it. Why just don't give them training and just just learn? Uh, why, is it, why is it important to have it engaging? Yeah, let's say it's like with, um, I don't know, if you want to teach children in a kind of way, you can even say, you have to do it, you have to eat it, you have to make it, or you can explain it to them, you can make them curious for the world and help them as parents not to grow. And more or less, this is the same what we do in corporates. We are and at a starting point now and we want a change, whatever change it is. We want you know, the whole digital transformation topics. We want to teach, I don't know, agile ways of working to our employees. And we... Um, we can just tell them you have to do it and you have to learn it and you need to prove here by certificate that you've done it. But this is not our main goal because what we want is that learners really um, yeah, can identify themselves with what they learned because in corporates, it's super important that they are also able to apply the knowledge to their daily work. Mm -hmm. And from... Yeah, learning research and from all the cognitive research, we know that humans uh, learn best and identify themselves best if they really get into it. And engagement is a kind of yeah motivation layer mm -hmm. to to yeah stay more in touch with the content. Yeah, so it's about motivation and uh, application. 
I, I understand. And can you maybe share like what um, techniques, I'm so sorry, uh, what techniques uh, uh, do you use and do you apply uh, to make it engaging, to make the learning engaging? Yeah, you can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. This is uh, probably um, very useful as an introduction for all of you. Now, this is what I call learner-centered um, yeah, learning design or course design. And it's based on the good old human-centered design. So all approaches I use come from, um, yeah, also product and service design from lean approaches, agile approaches, and um, combined with very modern learning didactics and engagement formats. So to keep it simple is how, no, how can we create a learning design that users or learners really love? The first of all, you know, the desirability. So what are really the wishes and needs of learners, curators and corporates? It's very important to understand your target group. It, it, it's a difference if we want to teach I don't know, some students, a new method, or if we want to, um, I don't know, engage a whole workforce in um, yeah, major ways of working and really want them to adapt it in their daily lives. And I've done it very, very often. And I always take the time at the beginning to talk to the people in the corporate because every culture, every company is a bit different. So that's super, super important. And also the ones who have to create, yeah, the curators know how to create the content. Sometimes it's me, I do it for my content. I sometimes I just coach or teach corporates and because they already have a lot of content and they say, wow, we have a software probably. If they are lucky, they bought Olga. Olga software, huh? <laughs> um, yeah, or whatever, a kind of a learning management software, they have good content. And then they contact me and say, no one is using it. Can you tell me why? Can you help me? We want them that they use it. How can I force people to do it? And then I come and say, don't force them to do it. Understand their needs and problems. They have to do it in their spare time next to their work. And engagement is... Uh, uh, yeah, a soft skill topic, and that's the 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 the, the red line, the rote Faden, you say in German. You have to put through the whole content um, format. So that's the first you have to have a look at, and also what is the goal of the corporate? What's what's the impact and the wish um, and the need they want to get after the employees? You no, know, ran probably courses or learning engagements. Then the next thing is. When I know what they all want and need and um, what kind of personalities they are, then I have a look at the feasibility. So what is, from a didactical point of view, useful to reach the goals for these target groups? What is the technical environment? What do they have or what do we have to buy additionally? And what is also from the organizational point of view to be, have, to have to be considered? This is super important. And then um, the third part, the viability. So really describe and bring on point what's the value we create for each target group, for the learner, for the curator, and for the corporate. Because you know it probably if you are in a corporate environment, the, what is the most lovely question a manager is asking before he invests money into you? You can do some guesses here in the group. What is, uh, what is the manager asking before he um, yeah, says, Stephanie or someone else, yes, please do it. What do you think? What do they want to know? The return on investment? Yeah. <laughs> One of these lovely super buzzwords. What's the return on invest if I do this? <laughs> yes, for sure. We are living in a <laughs> management world, in a, in a world where you think about what do I invest? What do I get out? Mm -hmm. And this is okay, you know, and this, it's not just money wise. Yes, for sure. They have to pay me. They have to pay Olga for the software. They have to pay their, their employees for the time they invest in it. And they want that it's super efficient at the end. That's what managers want. 
but this is not what learners and employees want. They want to be inspired. They want to know what's in for me. How can I grab it? So it's super important that you um, really yeah, give measurements and yeah, let's say impact indicators, how you measure the success for the learners, for the curators and for the corporate. And uh, because just if you really have a look at all these three circles, then you know, come to, to this melting pot and uh, because then every group will love it. <laughs> not just the managers, not just the employees. Mm -hmm. So now, because we said it's not just, I don't want to talk here in a monologue or in a dialogue with Olga, I would be curious to know from one of you, um, yeah, what, what you have for best practices or what you have. Yeah. Would someone of you like to share something with us? Yeah, I will also launch a poll about uh, the techniques uh, that can be used. Uh, and let's let's see what we, we can probably do this a bit later. I have also two other um, oh. slides. Probably it fits better. So if no one wants to share right now, so let's probably. Yeah, I will um, leave a poll here and uh, if we can look at it at any time. Uh, yeah, Stephanie, do you want to talk about uh, some of these slides? Yeah, because you just um, started with these different forms of uh, learning, like blended learning, social learning. There are various formats at the end, how you can um, yeah, bring, bring your <laughs> learning design out at the end, no? how you implement it. But before you do that, and after you have answered these first um, three questions in these three circles. The next thing is that you ask yourself, how do I reach really the learning objectives? Um, yeah, with a maximum of learning experience for the learners. So mm -hmm. after you've set goals and learning objectives, what's the best way to create a great learning experience for the learners? And I would like to share with you this um, taxonomy table from Gradbold probably also some of you who um, are yeah, experienced uh, learning designers know this for sure. Now you have this knowledge dimensions and the cognitive process dimensions. And a lot of um, yeah, learning designs or learning products get stuck in this first quarter. No? So you just... Um, share some knowledge and then you have some multiple choice questions and then you just learn content mm -hmm. for example no? so you remember okay facts <laughs> so this is um, the first stage of learning but as i mentioned at the beginning especially in corporate learnings we want more it's not just um, a driving license a theory driving license where you just uh, click on multiple choice questions, you really want that people practice and execute it and reflect on what they learned mm -hmm. um, in the corporation. And therefore you really have to get to um, deeper dimensions you know, so that the um, learners can really apply the knowledge, that they analyze it for themselves, that they evaluate what they did and also um, yeah, use other things they learn. So you just don't have to follow just the one line you learned, mm -hmm. no? um, curate it on your own, reflect on what you learned and share it with your peers. This is how a real high no, learning level or learning engagement um, starts. If you reach here on the right side, no, the metacognitive and the reflective part, this is our main goal in very good um, corporate learning design. And therefore the, the, the question you just shared in the poll, Olga, no? then after this, you can decide what yeah, didactical format and what way is the uh -huh. best to reach the goal. And one of my no, favorite, um, because I tried nearly everything <laughs> from massive open online courses, yeah, seminars, webinars, yeah, avatars, uh, everything. <laughs> I found out for myself that a good blended learning approach 
is um, the best of all worlds because it, um, yeah, you you have um, these live sessions even if they are online or um, on site, um, and then you have parts in between where you have asynchronous um, learning nuggets or things you can learn and apply on your own, and this is super useful and helpful to reach these highest um, goal in the taxonomy table. That's why I very often prefer blended learning, but it always depends what you want to reach. So first of all, think about what do your learners and the corporate and everyone needs? <laughs> What's the best way from the didactical, didactical and technical point of view? And how can we create a maximum of value um, for all our target groups and create a very good learning experience because if we have a good learning experience then the others are happy too, the curator and the corporate mm -hmm. so if i understand right the the blended learning so the synchronous parts of it help to reflect and maybe also execute right because it, you do it kind of face to face and you can uh, uh, reflect in a peer-to-peer -peer environment is that um, correct yeah, also it's what I um, very often do is in my um, blended learning approaches that I have a, um, yeah, a, a live um, kickoff. Mm -hmm. This is super important for the, for the bonding, mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> like, like you and me, like all of us. Now we see each other, we hear each other um, and, and we understand from each other where we come from, what we need, mm -hmm. um, because the power of um, groups um, just comes out if the group is really engaged with each other. So that's the reason why at the beginning, then I very often have two, three, four, one, I don't know, asynchronous learning nuggets, learning sessions in between. Then I have a, in, in the middle of whatever journey we have, another, hey, how, how are you doing? How are you feeling? And this is really more on the... Um, yeah, not, not emotional, but more on the really human touch of the course. So how easy was it for you to follow the course? What questions do you have? What is missing probably in the time in between where you couldn't, what, what have you not asked me via chat or whatever? And that at the end, I also create a kind of, um, yeah, let's talk about the results and share the experience with each other. And this is also what I do life and in between mm -hmm. I um, yeah, structure it with various um, formats they can do on their own. And this is useful because people are so different you know? and everyone wants to learn in a different way. So you have this mix of freedom <laughs> to, to learn on your own if you want, but then uh, you also have these touch points mm -hmm. where you uh, engaged with the group and mm -hmm. from my experience with over the last 10 to 15 years this was always the most successful journey from the learner's experience even if yeah for sure blended learning is sometimes more expensive than a complete e-learning format Mm -hmm. Or probably, you know, you have to find time slots and so on. So it really always depends. There is no one size fits all solution. And we can always choose what's best in which situation, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we can ask our participants. Um, like Everyone came here for a reason. And uh, I would like to ask a question, like uh, what 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 do you feel that is challenging in this uh, world of uh, making learning engaging? Uh, what is challenging for you as a professional or uh, as a starter? Uh, maybe you can share a, a little bit of story. Would be great to hear like uh, maybe some experience, something that uh, actually made you believe, okay, uh, this topic is resonates and I, I wanna come, I wanna listen, I wanna participate. Uh, please uh, raise your hands uh, and share some story or write in the chat as, as it's more comfortable for you. I 
I don't see any hands. You can even just talk if you don't find the you just raising can, hands. And uh, unmute yourself and just talk. Yeah, that's that also works. Um, I think people don't want to talk. Maybe maybe you can. Nisha, Nisha, I've seen that you unmuted oh, for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, this is Nisha here. Uh, so I, I as uh, Sefi yeah, said, I also believe blended learning is a best practice. So it also starts like, um, so for example, I was doing training for the partners on the software product. So I always ask them to blend it with their onboarding process. So I certain things they'll start with the, there should be a personal touch because I also did my uh, thesis on this similar topic. And most of the people said it was before COVID and most of the people said that they preferred classroom training in the participants. So unless there is a personal touch, people don't get excited about the topic. So it's important to have a personal touch when you are doing a training. So that helps and uh, certain topics shouldn't be so repetitive. So we can usually blend it with some micro uh, videos, small videos uh, and uh, st st such stuff. Then we can then we can make a learning more engaging. So this will be like a a personal touch will be there so in case they have any queries they can get back to them but the basic training like how to go to certain things or how to do some uh, uh this uh, structural life process stuff so process stuff we can add it in a video or a, uh, some uh, like uh, uh, the new scrum files but uh, uh, but uh, if you want uh, the initial engagement should be start with some person like we should have mm -hmm. a meeting should have a webinar or something should have a personal engagement and then once they start getting interest and in certain topics they can do it by themselves so that things can't get too long yeah super super interesting thanks for sharing isha it's super to to hear that you um, also prefer or see the value in blended learning. Um, but I would also like to know, because I've seen in the um, poll of Olga that um, also a lot of people answered scenario-based learning. Yeah. And yeah. I would be curious to hear from one example of um, scenario-based learning. And um, also, sorry to interrupt, uh, like I also forgot that there was another form of learning which most of them preferred is uh, on the job like when there are uh, people who will train them or seeing the people so they will be doing shadowing and all those stuff so those those things also should be considered yeah this is also very um, interesting this um, on the job training because now if we think back on this now we want to reach a higher learning goal because we want that people really work with the things that they learned in corporates. This is super important for the corporate as a return on investment. And what I also do very often is project-based learning. Mm -hmm. So I really, and, and I take topics the, the, the employees have in, in, in their daily work and force them to think about what project they, they would like to use as a kind of test case in the learnings and re then no, really help them to learn by doing, learn by practice and uh, within in the blended weeks when they learn on their own and I say, hey, you can do it on your own or you could even share your thoughts with a colleague or not challenge someone else with the question I gave you. And this helps uh, really to, yeah, to engage the learner um, in his or her daily, daily job. So thank you for adding this, Nisha. But coming back to the scenario-based learning, who voted for it and who can share a story of um, scenario-based learning? Someone did it, right? Actually, uh, six, uh, six votes were for scenario-based learning. Um, yeah, I can say some words. Yes, thank you. 
So uh, I'm working in a software company, which is um, provides pricing software. So we're a little bit uh, industry specific, right? So, and I very often during the trainings, the product trainings, I got a question. Um, I understand what we're doing, but I don't understand why we're doing it. This is very mm -hmm. common kind of uh, situation. So in this case, um, I was trying to guide them through a typical daily jobs, a typical scenario ah. of a particular pricing activity. So I said, mm -hmm. okay, let's imagine you're, you need to price a group of your products, right? You have this, this, and these questions. So what would you do? And then mm -hmm. we kind of either do it together or then I guide them through the steps and say, okay, so you need to decide what products will need to be priced so you can create this, right? Then you need to decide what type of pricing they will receive, right? That's kind of a logic that we have or it's built inside there. So I'm really trying to put them in the shoes of a very standard or particular user and guide yeah. them through. And I'm currently actually redesigning my product training in that direction completely because I see that it resonates much better than just explaining, okay, here is the functionality, here is how it works. That's what you can do with that. Yeah. If we blend it into the business scenarios <clears throat> and typical business scenarios, industry and specific, because it's impossible, every industry has their own pricing activities. And so far it kind of showed up quite successful from my point of view. Mm. Cool, super, super interesting. Thanks for sharing, Kate. And, um, what, what I find so super interesting and um, important is that you you used um, yeah, storytelling <laughs> in your scenario-based learning, which is something um, what I also um, really like. And this is also part in the gamification context. You know, you really create a scenario, a story, a real case, a, a real project. Uh, so people identify themselves much better with it and then are more engaged and this was a perfect example of this someone has raised yeah, yeah i will give a word to Srividya. i'm sorry it's, um, if you can yeah uh, you can talk uh, i cannot really pronounce the name i am really scared to <laughs> pronounce it uh, <laughs> It's okay, all guys. It's pronounced Shri Vidya. Shri Vidya. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank so, you so much. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks. And um, so, uh, yeah, I work for a non profit. So I think my uh, experience would be quite different <laughs> to do a corporate setting. Uh, and I just wanted to comment on scenario. Uh -huh. um, learning scenario based learning so uh, in in non profits when we do a lot of our uh, uh, trainings or capacity strengthening initiatives as we call it um, what we are aiming for is most of the times not um, you know a process related so we 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 are not aiming for a pure technical uh, skill building if if that is the um, Sometimes, yes, but a lot of times what you are aiming for is transformational learning. So where you are uh, uh, aiming for uh, not only tools, you know, methods and things like that, but you're also aiming for a mindset change, uh, a better understanding of, of the whole context, the better understanding of the issues um, and uh, things like that. So for us, scenario-based learning is 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 uh, very very of used often because that allows you to imagine uh, and transport yourself to a particular scenario um, and kind of then understand you know um, uh, 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 the things that are related to it, especially when we do something called gender labs or gender training, uh, mm -hmm. where uh, you are uh, you know uh, like where you are teaching things like feminism, feminist analysis, or you're talking about things like women's rights and gender concepts and issues and uh, things in, 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 you know, the discourse like uh, personal is political and all those things. So it becomes very, it's, it's not, you know, your lecture method or your self-paced method may not always work and a scenario building works. So you tell a story and you imagine yourself in, in that women's life and then you start analyzing stuff, then it's much easier to 
to uh, talk about how to do and then you know what we call uh, i'm sorry i'm bringing a lot of these terms here uh, but what you call a <laughs> feminist analysis right so uh, otherwise it becomes very theoretical very academic and very complex and and rigid uh, if you try and do it some other way whereas a scenario based learning system actually helps you to translate all very heavy academic concepts into uh, something that is very practical and something that is rooted in your own lived experience um and that makes it easier to you know to to learn to understand so yeah, yeah. super thank you very much for this um yeah great um other example and and again now what what you what you described is that and this is something where i also really stand for is this make make a learning really human you know so don't just uh, throw some you said i think you said yeah we don't just throw them some technical uh, skills uh, through and then tell them please learn it and um, no you also um, by nature made it um, engaging and made it um, light and light does not mean that it's trivial no <laughs> light just means it's also a form of um, engagement because it's super hard to reduce things on point and put a storyline and this is very often you can i don't know a lot of corporates a lot of employees and also a lot of students can tell you or also from your own experience how boring <laughs> some things can be so always not try to slip into the shoes of your learners and and ask yourself what's the the lightest and most fun way i can uh, bring the the content or what they should learn to them so it doesn't feel them that they have to learn it make them that they want to learn it because it's it's so great <laughs> you know this is i think um the most important point i have a yeah. question uh so uh, i really like this uh, uh, scenario based approach uh, in in learning i think it's it's great when you have some scenario and you choose something and you see how it develops differently and uh, my question is to those who have experience with that uh, do we do it like a human to human like storytelling and stuff or is it possible to use some tools to build like uh, maybe not fully uh, remote e-learning but uh, kind of blended uh, how do you do that do you use some tools or is it purely humans to humans uh, storytelling thing maybe kate uh, or srividya or uh, maybe stephanie you can share some um the way we use it uh, it's it's just one methodology that you can mm -hmm. use and you can use it in in any kind of um uh uh yeah approaches so yeah. you can use it as a blended approach you can use it on you know purely classroom um you can use it completely in an e learning platform mm -hmm. so uh what is more important is that you know the the crafting of of the scenario the crafting of the story um which is important so that it gives you certain probes certain pointers but still is not a story that is completely written uh -huh. so a lot is left unsaid so where you know you get user engagement learner engagement where you where you are like okay this is this made me think um and uh, uh and what is also important the second one is you give a story um and then you um um have those questions which is which is the second uh, most critical component so what questions do you then want your learners to to think so we have done it on premise when you uh, leave people to go away you know by themselves think through the scenario uh and and come back and then share um you have done you know um, done it with use of other liberating structures um mm -hmm. you know methodology and you you come by and you do your one two and then uh, force and and come back and talk about it um we have also incorporated that in your uh, purely e learning where um in your lms 
you get a story, you either listen to it or uh, you see a video of it. Uh, and then you come back and you, you answer certain questions, either in a journal that you would be maintaining or even in the, on the uh, like a formative assessment itself. Um, so it doesn't matter where, what the platform is. Uh, I think it's a, it's a tool, it's a methodology that can be used in multiple different situations. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, see. Uh, I have a question to the participants who haven't tried uh, the scenario based learning yet. After listening to what's been said, would you like to try it? You can just put a plus in the chat window if, um, um, if you don't want to talk, or you can just unmute yourself and talk and let's uh, brainstorm on it. Um, so uh, we have um, 15 minutes left. Uh, I want to just a little bit summarize like things that we spoke about and maybe we can uh, have a little bit more discussion uh, just to keep the track of what uh, has been told um, until now. So we've been talking that um, uh, I realized that uh, to mostly using and maybe effective techniques to make it engaging is blended learning and scenario-based learning. And from what I have understood blended is because we still, even if we are able to do self-paced learning, it's important that we have some social component and some human interaction. So especially in the beginning, maybe in the middle, in the end. And if we put some scenarios into it, it's even better. So it makes it engaging and make makes us um, apply it more and reflect more on what what we learn and we can do it uh, uh, using some tools using e-learning and using uh, like a face to face approach it's just methodologies that uh, can be applied to make to make it engaging so what what else what, what did i miss from <laughs> I would say perfect summary, Olga. Super good. Um, and I also, if we look at the poll, now we also see here social learning and um, gamification. And I would say they are not all silos next to each other uh -huh. no? because social learning is a part of blended learning. And uh, scenario based learning and gamification is also, um, no, has interfaces because you could even. Um, do a scenario based learning and do gamification rewardings um, once um, the learner has made a decision or has received something. So, what, um, what, it's really hard to pronounce your life, Srividya, Srividya, <laughs> um, what, what you mentioned was um, that it's super important for the engagement that you don't always tell the full story that you just tease the story and let them do their own decisions no and this is also something where um, gamification at, as a methodology could also help no but um, it like at the beginning said it really always um, depends it also depends on the capabilities you have in your team what I always say to my customers is um, that because they say, oh, now we want to do e-learning too. And then they say, okay, uh, what do we have to buy? And oh, I've seen there's something that is nice and I want that and I want that. And I always recommend to work at this um, effectuation principle. I don't know, some of you might have heard of it. And we also call it the, the, the fridge principle <laughs> because First of all, look into your fridge and look what you can cook out of the things you have in your fridge. And this is what I meant with look at the capabilities you have. What can you create out of this? Sometimes gamification is super nice, but it just works if, it's, if the principles are super detailed and you have to have someone who's really good in it. Otherwise the people cannot follow and then it's like, Ugh. so probably it could be easier to create a blended learning course with some modules and then you can play with it and iterate on it later. So yeah, this is just what I wanted to share, but I'm super curious to, to hear something else from others if they want. Yeah, maybe someone wants to share yeah, what, what 
kind of gamification uh, you use uh, or anything. <laughs> Who wants to 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 be unmuted? <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe uh, yeah. We, yeah, we are talking about oh, Madalena. Uh, yeah, Madalena, please. So hello, I'm Magdalena. I uh, yeah, I'm here first time, so just saying hello first. But uh, what I'm yeah, first of all, very interesting topics, and I would love to hear more also about gamification and stuff. I also I'm a consultant at the Rufi Park Institute, and we also do corporate learning. And I'm quite new, uh, about a year uh, in the field, so I'm still learning a lot. Uh, and we also do use a lot of storytelling and scenarios, etc. And I find it really interesting and useful and engaging. But the thing is, I'm what I'm really keep wondering about: um, how can we um, involve not only the learners but people who would be impacted by their learnings? Oh, yeah, uh, Super. just. I don't know how and in the journey at the beginning and after yeah. because even when they're like in my ideal award I would involve them like from the very beginning or even before <laughs> but would they how would they everybody's so busy they have on schedules etc so I just would love to hear uh yeah um, what do you think do you have any methods mm. for that do you have any ideas mm. just uh I think that's the part when they sometimes feel um, from my experience feel like uh, they don't have that much power in changing something mm -hmm. because uh, I would like to do this and that, but how they don't mm -hmm. care. And I'm not saying that's all the time, but mm -hmm. quite a lot. I see like, they are like, oh, I am learning and that's it. And how can I actually make uh, a change? Mm -hmm. What I can share with you, what I also worked on with a very smart other agency, they are called um, Forever Day One and we are creating unique learning experiences for corporates too. And um, what we did, because we had the same challenge uh, like you described, and then we started with credibility partners. So this is the, from the methodology, it's at mm. the beginning of the learning engagement, you tell the learners to find, I don't know, let's say two credibility partners, the more the better, but mm. two, two is a good beginning. Mm. It could be, for example, your, your supervisor, your project lead, your, who's really someone who's responsible for your learning impact. And then a second person who is a kind of your, your body from the content side. And you go to them at the beginning and tell them about the learning objectives and the learning goals you want to reach and why is it useful for the company and have an exchange with them if they also... Mm -hmm see it as useful as you do mm -hmm. and then put no, you um, you confirm your learning objectives and make them more concrete mm -hmm. to your corporation and then at the end of the or how it depends on how much time they have and invest you can even say after half of the journey and at the end of the journey you come back and then um tell them about what you learned and what you reached and this is super useful for for the learner because they mm -hmm. feel like oh I have to tell someone else in the company what I'm doing here yeah. so they are more engaged in reaching mm -hmm. their goals in the course the people from outside see oh there's an interesting course <laughs> uh, what are they doing there and I, mm -hmm. I, I really want to see what's in for us around this person mm -hmm. as a learner and you create this this snowball effect a bit mm. but most of all it's it really helps um, the learner to yeah to to validate their own uh, learning goals so mm. the credibility partners is something what I can highly recommend mm. but probably someone else here in the group has other good advices to share I, I don't have an advice I have a question uh, for example when Magdalena said that uh, there is someone that will be impacted by your learning. For example, if we do a training for customer care team and uh, uh, the people who will be impacted are the customers. So I would maybe like to have like a focus group within the customer that we could check 
how mm. did this learning uh, went? Yeah. Uh, that would be super interesting, I think. Also super interesting. It's also a kind of, yeah, then you probably don't call them credibility partners. It's then validation group in between or so, you know. This is um, also something super useful. So the more people you can share what you learned and get mm -hmm. feedback on how to use it in your daily work, this, this helps everyone, the learner, the people from outside, and also yourself as the one who um, curated the course because it might probably help you to make it even better the next time because mm -hmm. I don't know, they, they brought bring in new ideas as always. No? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A very good question, Magdalena. Yeah, let me know if it, if, it, if it helps. So let's uh, yeah. connect in LinkedIn and let me know That's if right. you test no, it just, and if it works. Just, yeah, just even <laughs> talking about this gives you directly some ideas yeah, how yeah. To, to make it grow and make it... Because uh, for me, the biggest thing is like, how do we make a real impact, not just yeah. Yeah. like sustainable impact yeah. that yeah. as you said the snowball effect would something will be grow on its own etc so we don't have to be always there watching and, and doing something so something yeah. i think you stephanie mentioned at the beginning it sounds really interesting to me as well yeah. so thank you yeah cool. actually uh, this is also about feedback having a feedback after training maybe before training during the training and some yeah. months after the training is also important and we will be actually having a our happy space event uh, about uh, feedback on training just uh, stay tuned and we will announce it <laughs> and yeah we have five minutes left I would probably like to share my last screen so just as a last inspiration um, if you hopefully you find it useful. Magdalena, would you like to add something? Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> okay, I just seen you. I know that it didn't, it didn't switch off. Or ah, okay. okay. I lower okay. hand, now I do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's just, um, I would like just to share my yeah, learning design in six steps, what I did uh, very often with um with teams with corporates with whatever and this is my my best practice over 10 years and this is also part of the design agility book but now a bit adapted for corporate learning design so yeah let's for sure no it's very important so i'm now talking that i have learning design as a project with the team in the corporate yeah it's not now about the the user and the learner, but when I get into corporates and I work with them and they tell me, well, we have content, we have software, or probably we have to find a software. <laughs> and uh, how can I create good corporate learning? Then I have this core team, then we do a kickoff. And then based on these lean approaches, we really have in the first, for example, I just uh, did it with the corporate in six weeks, but the two employees I'm working on with it have just one and a half day per week to work on this corporate learning design so it's really project management so what do we want to reach how much workload do we have and so on and then we make clear deliverables after each step so at the beginning really a discovery and interpretation you now what is our target group what are their wishes needs what do we have in our no, fridge effectuation principle? What do we have to buy? What is a must have, should have, nice to have, and all these things. Once we have this, what is our MVP and what is it not? <laughs> a minimum viable product. I, I'm, I'm not sure if everyone knows it. If, if not, um, no, please let me know. Then we go really into an ideation and learning journey session. So it's super important that you really always open the space and then extract a result of it. Then we have a learning journey, then we specify it and make a fine tuning on it, and implement it in, in the software or whatever. Then we test it <laughs> and evaluate it, um, iterate on it, include the feedback, and then we really deploy it. So with deploy, it means really the, the, the prototype, the first MVP and we, prepare the, the pitch for the decision makers, because this is very, we just need minimum resources for these six steps. And then we share our MVP, and then we need a decision on, um, should we move forward 
what money do we need for the next steps? Um, how can we implement it and make it a, a full um, product? The, this is just what I wanted to share. And if you want to learn more, just um, yeah, contact me if you want to know more about it. Thank you so much, Stephanie. We have to wrap it up. So uh, please uh, connect to Stephanie, connect to us if you want to learn more. And we have uh, one thing that we thought we could do together with you is that um, uh, together with Stephanie, we would like to maybe brainstorm on one on one with each of you if you have any specific challenge or any piece of content that you want to make more engaging. We would love to participate in this idea and help you. This is a free thing that we offer because uh, case uh, studies of people who are interested in this topic are very, very interesting for us. So if you want to be part of this uh, offer, let's say, uh, just uh, copy this link. Uh, Tanya, thank you for pasting it. Uh, just leave us your email and we we get in contact with you and we um, uh, uh, establish the next steps of how we can do it together. And uh, I believe that it would be super fun like this event. And uh, yeah, thank you again very much. Uh, uh, subscribe to our LinkedIn page to have uh, the announcements about the next events on these things. Uh, I can already tell you that the next event will be regarding learning analytics. I think it will be also super interesting. And um, yeah, let's stay in touch, connect to me, connect to Stephanie, and uh, uh, let's make this learning and development a happy space for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing your insights here in the team. Thank you, Thank Olga, you for Olga. organizing and uh, Tatiana. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you.